In part one, we looked at the ridiculous amounts of fuel supposedly being pumped into these aircraft and the possibility that the technology being used is way beyond the level they are telling us. To those who obviously misunderstood part one, I need to clarify. The airlines claim that fuel constitutes 50% of our ticket cost. I'm not saying that fuel is not being used. What I'm saying is that it's a fraction of what we're being charged for and a minor part of flight technology. Come on guys, don't hang around. We alone are responsible for 90% of the thrust. As stated in part one, we have the engine manufacturers themselves saying that 90% of the thrust comes from the compressed bypass air and not from the combustion chamber. That's not me saying that. It's the people who design and make these jet engines. So it must be true, right? Yes and no. Let's get into it. To make sense of all this, we have to embrace the idea of the ether. The ether was a totally accepted element in the past. Before Einstein and his wife concocted the widely acclaimed relativity theories, everyone, including all of the scientists, knew the existence of the ether. In one fell swoop, Einstein got rid of the ether and everybody else followed suit. The age-old technologies used in the design of these aircraft and engines also utilize the properties of the ether. That's the bit they're not telling us. To do so would fly in the face of contemporary scientific thinking and they would be forced to recognize the existence of this hugely important element. I said at the end of part one that I would be mentioning our little friends, the bumblebees. Well, to do that, I first have to bring you up to speed with Victor and Victor. If you visit Victor Schauberger's Ripley's Believe It or Not page, you will find it sadly lacking in important information. This man was a master at decoding the secrets of nature, a prolific writer and far ahead of his time. Yet the mainstream scientists chose to ignore his work and label him a nutcase. Just this fact should throw up a plethora of red flags with people. This man dedicated his whole life to the study of nature and he came up with some truly fascinating stuff. Levitation, propulsion through the ether and implosion technology to name just a few. Let's start with implosion technology to show you that he wasn't just making this stuff up. As you will see in this clip, the gas that she's holding would normally be enough to blow a gaping great hole in her hand, but it doesn't. That's because it implodes rather than explodes. The force goes inwards rather than outwards. Implosion technology. In three, two, one. Okay. You could judge by the loudness of the implosion that there was a great deal of energy created. Enough to seriously injure her, but apart from being slightly shaken up, she seems fine. Victor's main body of work was with water, but he postulated and demonstrated that this technology works just as well in other mediums. One of them being air, or the ether. Air is our medium, water is for the fish, but the two are intrinsically locked together because both mediums behave the same way when coerced. I highly recommend watching the links for Victor's work in the show notes. These patterns and properties are used throughout nature in the environment, in trees and shrubs, in flowers and in animals. Basically the whole of nature conforms to these rules and Victor figured it out. As I showed earlier, Victor confirms that using the Vorsex idea on an aircraft it will literally suck its way through the ether rather than thrusting against the air molecules. Schauberger's central approach here was the principle of matter transformation. The elements of the air, particulate matter and gases are converted in this repulsator. One part escapes through the ring rotator. And the radiation energy, Schauberger talks about synthesis electricity, is emitted through the central axis. The repulsin creates a biological vacuum along the axis in front of it, into which the aeroplane is sucked. The relatively small amount of fuel on board is used for takeoff, landing and taxiing. It's also used for the APU. 
The APU is the auxiliary power unit that's situated at the back end of most commercial aircraft. This is a small jet engine configured as a compressed air generator to feed the main engines at start-up and during cruise mode, amongst other functions. I must just add something that I didn't address in part one. Military aircraft like fighter jets use a lot more fuel than commercial aircraft. They need the extra power and thrust that combustible fuel gives. In cruise mode, a commercial airliner does not need the extra power as its forward motion is sufficient to suck enough air into the engine. Just a little observation here. The engines are designed to sit forward of the wings on pylons. From an engineering standpoint, it would be much easier to place them directly under the wings. As most people think, the jet engine spews out masses of superheated exhaust gas. If this was the case, then why would they put the exhaust directly under the wing where all the supposed fuel is stored? Next time you look at an aircraft, try and find the scorch marks under the wings from all of the super hot gases. You won't find any. The small amount of hot gas being ejected from the combustion chamber is surrounded by cooler, compressed air. Don't you think that these people should be in hospital with nasty burns from the super hot gases? Before we leave Victor number one, let's look at his vortex principles at work in real time. If you think his principles are just theories, then feast your eyes on this. Like the jet engine, the Garuda San Giovanni route needs a small force to start it, but then propels, impels itself infinitely using the medium around it. In this case, water. Despite the downward force of this water, the route impels itself even vertically, just as the jet engine does through the medium of ether. There is much, much more to talk about with Victor Schauberger's vortex principles and how the aircraft manufacturers utilize the natural forces of nature to assist flight, but I don't want this video to be too long. Again, check out Victor's work for yourselves and you'll see the connections. Time for Victor number two. Victor Grebenikov is lesser known than Schauberger, but his research and experimentation is just as extensive and important. It also derives its reasoning from nature. It's a man named Grebenikov from Russia. Uh, Grebenikov was kind of a uh, non-conventional scientist. He was an entomologist, did a lot of work with uh, you know, bugs, entomology. And his favorite thing was to go out into the steppes of Russia and into the various outer hinterlands and camp out in the summers and uh, study his favorite subject. This might look like a radio controlled bee, but it's actually a bee with a little radar transponder on it, which means that we can track this bee as it flies around the field. And these little guys can carry 90% of their body weight in pollen, so it won't affect the way it flies. First of all, the bees are flying much faster than predicted, an incredible 30 miles an hour, even when fully laden. The next surprise is where the bees go. They almost always overfly potentially decent food. And once they've found their patch, they then repeatedly shuttle to and from it. And this is the really clever bit. In spite of 30 mile an hour crosswinds, whether out or back, they all fly in dead straight lines. A bumblebee can't fly aerodynamically. Yeah, and he's right. And I said, well, what did bumblebees do? And they said, well, they levitate. And I said, well, how's that? And he says, come on, I'll show you. And he showed me, he wrote a book, incidentally. I don't know if it's still in print. It's in the Library of Congress. The book is called Tomorrow's Energy Need Not Be Fuel. And uh, in that book, he gave reference to what I'm talking about, that, <clears throat> that of levitation, that um, the bumblebee, when he starts to beat his wings, when he starts to flap his wings, 
there's a little cavity, a hollow cavity next to the larynx inside his, his system that's hollow. And when he beats his wings, he starts to resonate this energy and it goes back and forth, just similar to, um, to a guitar strumming on one side of the room and hitting the same chord on the other side of the room or uh, somebody hitting a high C and breaking a crystal. It's the same thing, it's resonance. And he said, what they do, they resonate. And when they resonate, they eventually reach the resonance of the field around them. And he explained it this way to me, that the earth was, of course, spinning, but it was, it was operating on a frequency of 8.5 hertz per second or so forth. And he says, once this bumblebee hits that resonant frequency of its surroundings, it becomes a free agent. It creates a magnetic bubble around itself, and it can go anywhere it wants. And I said, well, that's not in any of the science books. He said, I know. <laughs> you, know you probably never see it there either, but that's, that's what happens. They'll discover it someday and bring it out, but it, it's just uh, we have a conventional way of doing things, and then we have a natural way of doing things, and they're totally different. They're diametrically opposed. The important point here is the bees. As you've heard, the bumblebee shouldn't really be able to fly. Those wings are way too small to lift that chubby little body off the ground. In fact, it's a bit of a conundrum also for the mainstream scientists. They can travel in perfectly straight lines for long distances without any deviation, even during a howling crosswind. Because of the resonant frequencies produced by the vibration of their wings, they create a bubble in the ether protecting them from any outside interference. So levitation by sound waves is a real world effect. Do you want more proof? I found out that the, the bug wings themselves uh, we're creating an anti-gravity phenomena under certain conditions. These technologies are known and used in modern day aircraft manufacture. The vortexes being produced are helping the lift properties of the aircraft. This is why the engines are forward of the wings. If they were underneath the wings, then the vortex wouldn't do its job. It has to flow over and not under the wing. Next time you fly, try to listen to the hum of the engines. It changes pitch when going into and out of cruise mode. Just pure speculation here, but there are large cavities in the wings, which are tested with compressed air and not liquids by the way, and the engines produce a distinct hum, just like the bees do. So the tale of two victors comes to an end. I highly recommend watching all the video links in the description box as you will gain a much better understanding of the natural forces at work here. As always, this is just my own musings and they are by no means definitive, but the scientific evidence and the observable effects definitely backs up the theory. Two highly intelligent gentlemen that have had their research largely ignored by the mainstream scientific community. But the manufacturers are covertly using the technology to fly their planes. As per usual, it's us, the consumer, who's losing out, while these huge companies are reaping the financial benefits. In part three, we will look closer at the fuel tank explosion suppression techniques using the inert gas nitrogen. Nitrogen doesn't burn, but the question is, how fast does it expand when vaporized? Stay tuned and see you in part three. Thank you for watching.